Hi everyone. Just a little quick study material I'm trying to put together here for a quick review. Uh, this instruction will be BMA instruction 62 80.1 Charlie. Covers management of regulated medical waste. I'm going to talk about it here just a quick minute and we'll see. Well, some key terms I just put together just to help out regulated medical waste. You might be seeing um, abbreviation for it to be our MW non-regulated medical waste again just a different one and uh, BSO 18 personal protective equipment when it comes to PPE and uh, animal waste and hazardous waste just some of those quick terminologies or keywords I could come up with um, after I put reviewing the uh, the instruction but we'll take a look here and see what we can do to help one another because uh, this normally try to help some uh, sit up steady a little bit um, for the exam ahead of time, just playing and watching on YouTube or whatever thing you like to do. Again, I do apologize for my voice. Uh, my voice will be going in and out, recovering from the flu. So uh, bear with me. If for some reason you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm sorry. Um, it's just um, way of speaking, it's a little bit different. All right, but let's take a look at some of these things. When we talk about regulated medical waste, what are we really talking about? Um, when we bring this topic up, what we're looking at is um, any waste that has been generated from the hospital uh, to be uh, either contaminated, um, it has to be preserved or pretty much um, stored somehow without harming the public. Um, these are waste that will be generated during diagnosis of a procedure or from a patient. Uh, it can be something that will also be done when we're rendering treatment to patient or during immunization process of either human or animal. Now, when we include the animals in there, we're looking at animal subjects to trials, uh, trials and research. That's what we're looking at. Uh, that's what the instructions try to focus on. But this regulated medical waste happens to be divided and organized into nine different groups. These nine different groups will go over, I might be talking about these nine groups over and over, maybe by three different times, three or four different times in this short um, review session. Uh, the, the good thing about measuring this over and over is uh, at some point it will help individuals retain that information. Um, sometimes it's good to listen to information one or twice or three times before it can actually be uh, a memory muscle, I call it a, a muscle memory for individuals <clears throat> based on your learning styles and learning abilities and capabilities and what have you. But these are the nine groups. Group one, group one focus on cultures, stocks, and vaccinations, right? The cultures will be what will be sent down to the lab. Of course, you know what a vaccine is. Uh, group two, focus on the patho uh, pathological waste. Um, in sounds of pathogen and non-pathogen, uh, non-pathogen does not really cause any harm for pathogen does, but in this case, group two would be path uh, pathological waste. Group three, you have your blood and your blood product. Um, this could be anything that you get to deal with blood. And if you look at it, uh, on the right hand side of that slide, you will see blood and blood products. When looking at it, what we're focusing on is Primarily human blood, human blood, human plasma, serum, those kind of things. That's what we're focusing on. But this is not to neglect the fact that we also have animal blood, especially for laboratory uh, testing purposes. Uh, animal blood can also be one of those that could be affected based on what uh, the, um, the case study or the research is. Uh, next thing you see is used shops. The used shop you see in there is uh, referring to group four. Uh, those are shops that has been used either um, medication uh, vaccine like the uh, empty vial of a medication or a needle that has been used or something like that that's what you'll be focusing on group five is animal waste and we'll talk a little bit about animal waste here because when we talk about animal waste we not just focusing on uh, animals that are not being consumed but what we're looking at is animals that are being used in the laboratory for research purposes and those uh, animals have to be disposed of. Uh, on another avenue, you can also consider animal waste to be a residu uh, residue or residual of a biological uh, testing weapon uh, to be considered as animal waste because they will use animals to make most of their tests and use it as test subjects. Group six, you have your isolation waste. Isolation waste, when we focus on isolation waste, one of the things we focus on is <clears throat> look at the biosafety level. 
Uh, bar safety level indicates that there are four different levels from level one all the way to level four. Level four is the most stringent level. So in this case, when we did it with group six, group six will require us to actually implement about um, uh, implement about safety level four, and that will be the most stringent level that we have. Group seven is your unused sharp, just as group four was your used sharp. Group seven is unused sharp. Uh, unused sharp will be any uh, things that have not been used. They will either expire or for some reason they were defective for whatever other reason or when uh, they went to open it up, it had holes or uh, the integrity was uh, compromised. Group eight will be others and others will be we'll focus mainly on fluids, other fluids that you will see uh, from one session to the next. Uh, in, those fluids will be designated by a local infection control officer. They might say, hey, this fluid will be considered as infectious fluid or no, it is not. So we just put that into group group A. Group A will not rather go into the um, into group two or group three, even though you have fluids associated with it. But again, this is one of the ones that if you can put it into, if it can be categorized into group two or group three, then definitely we can categorize it into group eight. Group nine will focus on chemotherapy and tra uh, chemotherapy trace waste. Um, that's one of the uh, the final group for uh, medications or individuals that be going through chemotherapy or providers giving those medications for chemotherapy. The uh, container or those needles that's actually used has to go into that section. That's pretty much the uh, nine group of um, nine groups of the uh, regulated medical waste category online in this instruction. And we'll continue on and see what else we have moving forward. If you have any questions, again, I will uh, discuss this information as, at a later time. It will repeat itself again and hopefully we can address those questions for you here uh, real soon. Once again, this is another slide. I just included this one in there for um, order to review again real quick. The same thing, group one, you're looking at your culture, your sites, and your vaccines. Group two, your pathological waste. Group three will be your blood and blood product. Now, what will be group four and group seven? Can anyone take a, a guess on it? I'll give you about two seconds. All right, well, if you actually gets used and unused shop, that was absolutely correct. So group four and group seven will be your used and your unused shop. Uh, group five, that will be your animal waste. Group six, that's isolation waste. What will you need for isolation waste? Another quick, quick question. Yes, you are correct. Um, bio safety level four, that's what you, you'll be need, uh, you need for isolation waste. Group eight, Will be orders and that include other infection control um, things that are recommended by your infection control officer. Group nine is your chemotherapy. Your chemotherapy. Good job. Good job. Good job. Now let's talk about some roles and responsibilities here, because these instructions, when these instructions are written, they are written for a specific reason. They have individuals that have to initiate the instructions. Individuals that have to be responsible to. Uh, get guidance from the instruction individuals that be responsible to execute those instructions. Uh, since this instruction, this is uh, BMAN instruction 6280.1 Charlie, that means point one Bravo was canceled and there was some updated information that was included into the Charlie version. And that's what we are discussing now. So the chief of BMAN is responsible to formulate and decimate this instruction of to their echelon three uh, commands. Uh, the chief of BMAIL will be responsible to coordinate uh, our MW policies and the roles in which they play in the, uh, in the military and the environment. Now, the company commander or the commander of the installation now for Navy uh, Medicine Echelon three command, what it will do is they will ensure that you have an EPM um, to be appointed. That's their primary job. Well, they get the instruction and the guidance from BUMED, from the chief of BUMED, and they will ensure that they do have someone appointed. And that person appointed will be appointed in that position. The environmental program manager have to be appointed. That individual that is appointed will be responsible to respond to BUMED requests. Right? So the commander appoints an environmental program manager to execute the instructions uh, that, that came up from the Chief of Bill And then the commander will also respond to the, the Chief of Bill with updates and other requests that they, they will have. Now, 
from that era now, since the EPN has already been appointed by the commander of Echelon 3, the commander now will send everything else down to the commanding officer or the officer in charge of their Echelon 3 sub-command. Those individuals then, their responsibility will be to support and be in compliance with the regulations that were set forth by the uh, chief of Buman. And then the uh, commanding officers and the officer in charge will ensure that uh, the commander actually appointed an environmental program manager. Once those things are done, then the environmental program manager happens to have his or her own responsibilities. And that will be to make sure that the RMW is identified and is being managed. Another thing is that the EPM will also be responsible to provide day-to-day -day management of the RMW program. They will develop, implement, and maintain a plan on how they will execute this program while coordinating with the EPOC at the sub-command level. This is how everything goes. Chief of Buman, get everything ready, send it down to the commander, say, hey, I need this to be done. A commander say, okay, well, I have to appoint someone. I will go ahead and appoint my EPM. EPM will be working for these commanding officers and the officers in charge to get these things done. Officer in charge say, hey, let me check. Oh, okay, I can execute it. Do you have an uh, EPM? Yes, you do. Okay, well, that's good. EP will then say, yes, I'll go ahead and do this, but I have too many things to do. So I will send this one down to another person that will help me with this process, and that will be the EPOC. The EPOC will then take over and will be pretty much over the command itself because everyone happens to have their own level to work on. The environmental point of contact or the EPOC will provide the overall management of this program. They will coordinate with the EPM. They will attend their initial environmental training because those training has to be done before they actually take over. And now they will ensure training records will be retained. Retaining those training records, they will be setting length of time uh, they have to use to retain those, uh, those records. The EPOC now will then uh, send this information out to all employees that will be identified to handle our MW within the organization. Um, they will make sure that these employees are properly will properly manage the RMW program. They will, uh, the EPOC will make sure that all employees happen to have their initial training before they get started. And then every year they will have to get a refresher training. They will follow appropriate procedures, report any spill or leakage of uh, the regulated medical waste. Because if those things happen, EPOC will not be at the front level. This is where all employees come in get a training to make sure they can communicate out up to the EPOC and the EPOC will send out up to uh, the EPM. Now, the containers that we're looking at, containers that these things have to come in. Um, when we start gathering some of these uh, uh, storage units or try to um, put these things in one other location, let's say we have a shop that needs to be placed in a, a shop container, there are requirements on what that container supposed to be high, supposed to be like a high can hold. And one of the things that you'll see is that the container has to be labeled and marked with a biohazard sign. Okay, the universal biohazard um, symbol. If it's a plastic linen that's being used, it has to meet this requirement. It has to be at least 165 grand on impact to kind of make it a little bit resistant to uh, um, to break or spill or crack or something like that. Uh, the container has to be rigid, it has to be rare, or it could be a clear container too as well. Now, all RMW container must remain closed when not in use. The reason is we don't want someone putting a hand in there, so you have to uh, get it closed. Um, uh, and then you have other two things I just put in here that's a little bit further down in the instruction was uh, extraction. That should be extracted tooth or teeth. Uh, I tend to put in something else in it. Uh, extracted tea, uh, per the instruction, it is not a pathological waste. It becomes pathological waste when it is attached to something else, and I will address that here shortly. The placenta, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit different. It is considered a pathological waste, and before it's given to a patient, other things have to be considered. Both of these things, the extracted teeth and the placenta can be given to a patient. Except for the placenta, now in order for it to be given, it has to be tested. And once it's given to the patient, 
The patient cannot return it to the hospital. The patient has to take it with and straight at home. The patient cannot leave from one uh, clinic to the next clinic where the placenta in the hand. The placenta has to leave the command and actually go home with the patient. On-site transport and storage. Uh, other things that you see for pathological and non-pathological uh, non waste. Uh, they have to be stored for temporary reason before they are actually picked up and transported. If you have your pathological waste, when storing this, uh, it has to be refrigerated immediately and frozen. Now, uh, if it's refrigerated, it has to be frozen. Uh, the, thing, the good thing about this is that it will remain on site uh, for longer than 24 hours. If you have your pathological waste to be on site for more than 24 hours, the requirement is it has to be stored in a refrigerator. And when it's stored in a refrigerator, it has to be, it needs to have the ability to be frozen. If that is done, it can be there for at least 24 hours. Now, if it's frozen, one of the things that you see happen is this. If it's frozen, now it can remain on site for up to 30 days. Now, that does not mean that you can't get it out of there. You can still get it out. But if you want to keep it up for a little bit longer time, as long as it's frozen, you can maintain it for 30 calendar days, not working days, but 30 calendar days. For your non pathological waste, these are these items has to be unfrozen for seven days. Uh, that's just what you have to do for those ones. Uh, leave it unfrozen for seven days, and within that seven days period, it can be disposed of. And I will go on to the uh, next area where we'll repeat some of these things we already talked about, at least so you can see what we're looking at when it comes down to treatment and disposal. As I said earlier, group one, group one focus on your cultures, your stocks, and your vaccines. Those things, when once we are disposing and we're trying to treat them, we have to get an incinerator. Uh, we can um, get it to be uh, disinfected, chemically disinfected, or steam sterilized. Uh, group two, in the sterilization process, will focus on the manufacturer recommendation. Group two, your pathological waste, when we're focusing on this one, it has to be incinerated or sterilized too as well. Group three, your blood and blood product. Uh, we normally use the uh, sanitary sewer system to send it down, or in some cases, we can just get it sterilized and incinerated. Group four and group seven, those will be your used and your unused shops. Uh, those will be incinerated, or it could be steam sterilized too as well. Group five is your animal waste, incinerated or steam sterilized. Group six, your isolation waste. This is the, the one now that you'll be needing something else will be steam sterilized and also isolated uh, and incinerated. Group eight, steam sterilized or incinerated. Group nine, as your chemotherapy trace waste, uh, incinerated and steam sterilized too as well. Now, if for some reason something has to be sterilized and the manufacturer failed to provide recommendation on what to use, what which parameter to use for that sterilization process, uh, the baseline sterilization process that will normally be used would be the uh, 121 degrees Celsius. That would be for 90 minutes at 15 PSI for sterilization or 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes at 15 PSI just to sterilize it. And this is in a case where the manufacturers fail to provide a baseline for sterilization uh, to be used. Now, training. Uh, training applies to everyone. Uh, for RMW, the requirement for training for all employees focus on this. All employees need to have training before they actually start working in that environment. Once they have their initial training, uh, they need to have a refresher training every year after their initial training. Now, uh, there are, there's another distinction on this because you have individuals that are working in the hospital itself that will gather some of those things together in the hospital and then send it out. And you have those individuals that will be responsible to get it from the hospital and transport it to the off-site location. The individuals that transport it to an off-site location have to get their own training done. They still get the group training for everybody, but they get an additional training too as well. They have to complete a training that is specific for class six. Right now, division uh, on the other hand, for, for class six division point blank, now there's also a 6.2 hazard and material training that has to be done to as well. Now, the initial training is required to be done, but the difference is the annual training, uh, the training that's required for all employees has to be done before you start. 
for this other one, for those individuals that transferred into an offsite location, they can do that training, but that training does not have to be done before they start. The training has to be done at least within 90 days from the day they started. And once that is done, every 24 months, they have to do a refresher training. That's the distinction between those two. And the next thing you'll see now is just give you a snapshot of so many things we just talked about, incineration and uh, sterilization and all those things. It just talks about it. Now we're going to do a quick review to see what you know and what you don't. Uh, hopefully you know more information than I do by now. But uh, let's see what we have with some of these questions. Now, the first question is uh, non-sharp RMW, re uh, regulated medical waste bags, must be red or what other color? Uh, the other color, if it's not red, it has to be yellow. has to be yellow for non-sharp regulated medical waste. Who is responsible for formulating Navy medicine policy and guidelines related to the management of RMW? The person that's responsible for this will be the chief of BUMED. Chief of BUMED gets the instruction and then send it down uh, to the uh, the command. So Chief of Bumail will be the responsible responsible party for formulating this instruction. Who provides day-to-day -day man management of a regulated medical waste program at the apparent command and oversee subordinate commands? Now since this person is overseeing subordinate command, definitely will be the environmental program manager because the environmental program manager happens to have the EPOC at that subcommand that EPOC have and has all employees to do the work. Next question, what governs regulated medical waste for shipboard medical personnel? What governs regulated medical waste for shipboard medical personnel? Now, because we're on a ship, it has to be a float medical waste guy. A float, the ship is a float on sea, so it has to be a float medical waste guy. What must be done with pathological waste if it is to be maintained on site for more than 24 hours? What must be done with pathological waste if it is to be maintained on site for more than 24 hours? If it is to be maintained on site for more than 24 hours, we have to place it in a frozen storage. Uh, extracted teeth with amalgam are consider which type of waste? Extracted tea with amalgam, I consider which type of waste. Now, because it's an extracted tea and amalgam together, that's two. That will be a dual waste. Uh, a dual waste. What color container should be used to trace chemotherapy waste? The color container to use to trace chemotherapy waste will be yellow. When handling isolated waste, group six. When handling isolated waste, group six. Uh, the group that we're talking about now is group six. Group six focus on isolated waste. So when handling isolated waste, group six. Isolated waste or when handling group six um, waste. Who should be contacted for guidance? Because it's uh, an isolated waste gets to do with infection. So we have to contact the infection control officer. Our MW storage areas must be marked with an orange or orange-red sign that is legible from at least what distance. Uh, our MW storage area must be marked with an orange or orange-red sign that is legible from at least what distance. The distance we want to be able to see that sign should be 5 feet. Uh, in the absence of manufacturer recommendations, what specifications should be used for steam sterilization? In the absence of manufacturer recommendations, what specifications should be used for steam sterilization? 121 degree Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, 121 degrees Celsius would be the requirement, or 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has to be in there in the uh, in our story, I mean, in our uh, heat area for 90 minutes, and the PSI has to be 15. It has to be 121 degrees Celsius or 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes at 15 PSI. The next question that we do have now is uh, almost there. Almost there. You're doing good. Doing good. How often must a geobacillus stereothermophilus spore strips 
be used to test sterilization process. How often must geobacillus stereo stereotemophilus spore strip be used to test the sterilization process? This will be done weekly. Now, please understand this is not a sterilization process for instrumentation when it comes down to uh, surgical instruments. For surgical instrument, it has to be done daily. For uh, taking care of radical, uh, medical waste, it has to be done weekly. Facilities must develop a medical waste management plan and review it at what minimum interval. Facility must develop a medical waste plan and review it at what minimum interval that should be every year what is our mw group 2 what is regulated medical waste group 2 group 2 will be your pathological waste what is regulated medical waste group 5 what is regulated medical waste group 5 group 5 will be your animal waste what is medical waste group 6 what is regulated medical waste group 6? Your group 6 will be your isolation waste. How long must training record for regulated medical waste be maintained from the date of training? Uh, the record should be maintained from the date of training. Uh, that will be uh, the training should be maintained for three years. How long must facilities maintain regulated medical waste shipping documents and manifest? after the waste was accepted by the transporter. Once the transporter accepts that document, the time we have to keep that document for starts. And that length of time has to be at least two years. We have two years to maintain that document. And we also have three years to maintain uh, our training record when it comes down to regulated medical waste. This concludes this short review of the instruction. Once again, the instruction is BUMED instruction. 6280.1c. View med instruction 6280.1c. It focuses on management of regulated medical waste. Good luck to you on your exam and uh, see you on the other side. Welcome to the party.